We're live. Hey guys, welcome. We're gonna wait a couple minutes to make sure everybody gets on. We should be starting right at two o'clock. While you are waiting to log on, I want to hear what your favorite part or favorite thing you've done since you've gotten this stay-at-home order. I'll start. I got to go home. I'm from Virginia originally, and my parents still live there. I got to go back and meet the Bernies Mountain Dog. My parents had just adopted, so I got some good puppy cuddled in, and then made my way back down to Florida. Let me know what your favorite part's been. Megan's behind the phone. Megan, say hi. Hi, guys. You saw her yesterday. She's going to be reading your questions to me, saying hi, letting you guys know everything while we go through our citizen science of day Woohoo! All right, we've got 11 people on. Who we got? Who we got? Oh. Anyone we know? You. You can look on your phone, Megan. <laughs> Thank you. We've got our friends on. Oh, hi, friends. Um, Ron Peter says hello. Hello, Ron. Hey, Ron, how are you? Welcome to Citizen Science Week. Rachel says hi Nicole. Hey Rachel. Hi Rach, I'm here too. <laughs> Alright, let's start in just a few seconds. Woohoo, who's ready to learn about some parrot fish? They're pretty fun fish. I like them. How are we We're good. We got 16 people now. Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome. We'll wait another 30 seconds, see if anyone else is logging on, and then we'll start talking about sun care. <laughs> Hi, citizen science peeps. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> All right. I'm currently balancing the phone on my phone. That's where we're at right now. Makes it feel like there's two screens on the Extra pressure, but it's fine. All right, well, we'll get started. Welcome back to Citizen Science Week. I am Nicole, and I'm so excited you guys are celebrating Citizen Science Month with us here during this week. Yesterday, you guys got to talk with sweet Megan about marine debris and microplastics, and then Monday, you guys talked with Maria and Emma about sea grass surveys. Today we're going to be talking about parrot fish surveys, but before we jump into that, I just want to remind you guys what citizen science is, and it's the collaboration of science with anybody that wants to do science. So it's observations, it's measurements, things like that, where we here at Brain Lab have a really cool opportunity to be a part of that science, because we have such a cool and unique environment that we are immersed in day in and day out, that we can add to the data for scientists around the world, especially around South Florida, who aren't able to go out into the field every day and who just need people and eyes out there observing and measuring, which is pretty cool. Today we are going into Parrot Fish Surveys, which is a program we are collaborating with Dr. Burke Pyle from the University of California at Santa Barbara. And Dr. Burke Pyle's relationship with us here is looking at our sweet parrotfish, but his research is mainly focused on predator and prey interactions. Within his research, he's really looking at how a certain animal can impact their habitat based on what they're eating and what they're excreting. And so that's where our parrotfish come into play. But before we even talk about what our parrotfish are eating, maybe what they're excreting, we need to know what exactly a parrotfish is. So I have my PowerPoint up here. I know I wish I could take you out to the reef to show you an actual live parrotfish, but Yes. We have someone asking if you can speak a little slower. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I will try. I'm not the best at speaking slow, but I will work on it. Um, I wish I could take you out to the reef and show you parrotfish in real life. However, it's a little windy out there, a little choppy, and not the best cell perception a couple miles offshore. So our PowerPoint is the best thing we can do for you right now. Hopefully we'll get some cool videos up for you guys in the future to see these parrotfish in action. So, parrotfish are a family of fish within our community that have three really easy 
helps them scrape and graze on their habitat. So it's fused together and actually can pull the algae off. Sometimes, though, they take more than the algae. And we'll talk about that at the end, what happens when they accidentally take some limestone. It's one of my favorite fun facts about parrotfish. But that fused beak is the most easy way, or at least to me, to identify our parrotfish. Next, we have their caudal fin or their tail. So instead of going all the way to the front, we're going to send it all the way to the back. Megan, you want to get a little closer so we can see this caudal Oh, yeah. All right, so there's take a look. three main types of caudal fin in our fish world. There's a bunch around, but we have three common types. Our first one is this forked caudal fin. So it has two lobes that have a nice big V in the middle. That doesn't quite look like our pair of fishes, though, right? Megan, do you think it looks like our parrot fishes? Oof, I would probably say no. No. So we'll go to the next type. We have another type is our lunate tail. We often see lunate tails on our big migratory fish, like our sharks that travel big oceans. And they have two lobes as well, but they are more shaped like that crescent moon. So they have that nice curvature as well. Do you think our parrot fish has a curved tail like that, Megan? Oof, definitely not. So it must be that third type. And that's our truncated which has a lot of surface area all together in the middle. It doesn't have two lobes, it's just one lobe. While this pair of fish looks like it has some curvature, its tail is more in that truncate category, in that roommate. So we need to stick it with that truncate tail. So we first got that beaked, then we have this truncate caudal fin or tail, and then the last but not least for our pair of fish is their scales. And most fish you can't see individual scales from really far away, away, but our parrotfish have these really beautiful hexagonal scales, which when you look super close up, you can see that six-sided shape, but you can also see how their coloration pattern makes each individual scale very distinguishable. Most parrotfish, you can see that hexagonal scale even from 10, 15, 20 feet away, all the way up to the surface if you're snorkeling, you can see those six-sided shapes, which is really cool. Awesome, look how pretty. I know, that is a really pretty picture. Unfortunately, we don't have this pretty of scales here. This is an Indo Pacific parrotfish, but still really cool. We have four parrotfish, though, that we want to talk about here in the Keys. So we have the Keys Marco that we are monitoring right now. Megan, do you want to talk about the Keys Marco? Yes, so we have four parrotfish that we are monitoring right now. Our first parrotfish is the Keys Marco, which is the Keys Marco. We have four target species, and we look at their terminal phase coloration. So parrotfish are hermaphroditic, meaning they're born as females and then could potentially change to male throughout their life. That might mean a coloration change from male to female, but they often have coloration changes from juvenile to adult. So for the sake of this study, we are only looking at terminal adults, whether that's super males or males or females. So this is the one that changes probably the most dramatically in color. This is our terminal male for our stoplight parrotfish. Stoplight parrotfish are often blue, green in coloration throughout their body. They have some pink color, but my easiest way to identify them is if you look at their caudal fin, they have two yellow bands. One that goes right to where their body meets that caudal fin, and one that goes along the back of their caudal fin. If they don't have that yellow coloration, we can pretty much guarantee it's not a stock white parrotfish. I also help remember it has pink, green, and yellow, kind of like a stock white would have. Have that red coloration, that green coloration, and yellow all combined together to make it a stock white parrotfish. Another parrotfish we have down here is our blue one. I know the color is pretty wild on that. Can you see that pretty well, Megan? It looks like a big blob of blue, which is very accurate. <laughs> These guys are fully light blue from head to tail, and they're the easiest ones for coloration because they don't really change that often. They're this blue color across. However, we don't see blue parrotfish as abundantly as we see our other two. It's more rare that we see our blue parrotfish, but they're still out there munching and crunching out at the reef. Another fish that looks similar to our blue parrotfish is our midnight parrotfish, which have this blue coloration of the head, similar to our blue parrotfish, and then they move to this dark blue black body. So if it were to have blue and black, it would be our midnight parrotfish. If it was just all blue, it would be that blue parrotfish. So those are three out of our four. Our last one is my favorite because they are the funniest looking fish sometimes. And it's our rainbow parrotfish. These guys have an orange coloration all the way up their head and it merges more to green and then back to that orange or red closer to the tail. 
Most commonly, our rainbow and our stoplight characters are confused together because they're the most colorful. However, easy ways to identify them apart is that yellow banding on the tail for our stoplight parrotfish and also the orange head on these guys for our rainbow parrotfish. So we have four different types of parrotfish. And parrotfish as a general are why we study these guys. It's really, really important in understanding what they are eating because parrotfish are mainly herbivores. Most of the time we see them munching and crunching on algae. We call them scrapers and grazers because they'll use that beak and they'll take clumps of algae off of our rocks. And they'll spend up to 90% of their day eating that algae off of our reef. And why is it really important for us to be eating algae off the reef? Does anybody know? Ooh. Let's see. We had a lot of people say that the blue parrotfish look real fun. They are really fun. They have a bigger forehead too. I don't know if you can really see that one. So no. It looks like they have a melon stuck to the top of their head. They're pretty, they're pretty fun. <laughs> Any guesses on why we care that our parrotfish eat algae? Ooh, not yet, but again, we've got that lag, you guys. When you comment, it does take a little bit for us to see, so. If you are answering, we'll probably see him in a few seconds. If not, I'm going to answer this question. <laughs> um, we do. Oh, she's making me participate. Um, you guys, we have a question from Ron. Are parrotfish commercially valuable? Ooh, are parrotfish commercially valuable? I don't believe there's a huge fishing industry here in the U.S. for parrotfish. Do you agree with that, Megan? Yeah. I know it a lot of smaller primarily as like a in-home food source, but I would say it's not a huge commercial industry. Have you seen it huge anywhere you live, Megan? No, I have not. It's pretty infrequent to see parrotfish being eaten. No. Um, we do have an answer, Ooh, what's our answer from Rosa. Keep the water clean. Ooh, keeping it clean, absolutely. So when we talk about our coral reef, or our corals in general, having high nutrient levels will increase our algae. And that algae is really bad for our corals, especially because they can outcompete them for space on the reef. And they can actually grow up and over on top of our corals, which would be pretty bad. It would suffocate those animals. So having guys like our parrotfish or like our big sea urchins out there munching and crunching on algae all day, every day, is going to control those algal populations. It also creates space on that reef where there is clean limestone for our coral to settle. So the larva of our coral will actually settle onto that clean limestone, and they don't really like algae to be up in their business. It's something that's competing with them for space, for resources. So having that nice clean area allows for better success. Yeah, what's our question, Meg? Um, someone asked if parrotfish are harmful for corals. So that's a really good question. We have actually seen some parrotfish nibbling on corals, especially here at Marine Lab. There's an infographic on it on our virtual site as well that I'll mention at the end. But for the most part, we see the majority of what they are eating is algae. So right now, we don't see a huge threat to our parrotfish eating our corals in a negative way, but they do much. It helps maintain the health of that coral as well to have predators coming in and eating them in a healthy population level. All right, so back to these guys on why they're really, really important and why we don't know a lot about them. So Dr. Burkhan and a lot of researchers around the world have many unknowns to the complex community that is our coral reef. We don't understand how a massive amount of parrotfish or a lack thereof could be impacting our reef in a full picture. So while there are a lot of questions, we're focusing on three main points today with our parrotfish, and that's their diet, their foraging behavior, and their rate of grazing. So we do a study basically looking at what they're eating over a period of time. That period of time is pretty short. It's only three minutes that we'll survey. But before we get into how we survey, let's talk about what they could potentially be eating at our reef. So the first big one is one huge category. And I say it's probably the most abundant out at our reef, and it's algal turf and Crestos coralline algae, or CCA. You'll hear me say that a lot. They kind of cover the limestone of our reef like a blanket. The algal turf looks kind of like green fuzz sometimes, or yellow sediment fuzz, sitting on top of that rock. 
where our Questos coralline algae looks like it's covering, like coating our reef, kind of hard, more rigid. I always describe to students like when you get an ice cream cone and you dip it in chocolate and that fudge hardens around, that's kind of similar to how this CCA looks on our reef. So these two are combined together and usually we see them munching and crunching on these two the most. However, we do also have coral in a category as well. So we have a question about coral. We have seen parrotfish nibbling on coral, but what we're focused on for coral is our stony corals, like this big ring coral right here, or things like elkhorn coral and staghorn coral. And we're also focusing in on our fire coral. These two together make up that coral category that our parrotfish could be munching on. Next is our macro algae. So our plant looking like structures that are made out of algae, sometimes single cell, like our Alameda over here that join in a huge colony, or our Dictyota that kind of looks like seaweed to me, a little bit more yellow, a little bit more brown. These guys will pop up as little plant likes around our reef, sometimes within that algal turf. So monitoring our parrotfish, you have to be pretty diligent to see exactly where they're biting. And then last but not least, we have our classic seagrass and sand. Pretty self-explanatory, we've seen them much on that. And also sponges, like this big base sponge right here. Sometimes they will occasionally eat those. So, when we get out to the reef, we've taken our boat right out, we're getting ready to survey our parrotfish. Each buddy pair will get a chart just like this. And I have one right here. It's double-sided, so I'm gonna try to zoom it in a little bit closer. Perfect. Oh yes, and this data sheet is waterproof paper, underwater paper. So the clipboard, the pencil, and the paper will all go in with the buddy pair, and they'll be able to write and tally while watching that parrotfish. On the boat, I always ask my students and my citizen scientists to fill out these first three categories before even getting in the water. Because the more information we have filled out on this paper, the more information we can give scientists, the more they can understand about what's going on based on these observations. So the date would be today's date. The location would be where we are on the reef, say dry rocks maybe. For our practice video, it might be a tropical island somewhere at the beginning. And then our observer is your name. I always like to add to observer as well, something that associates me as an individual. So if I were to write down today, I would write Nicole, and then I would comma Marine Lab, associating me with an organization. If you're a high schooler or a middle schooler, you would add your school as well just so we know where that information is from. It makes it as accurate as possible. Once, yes. Sorry, we had a question. Go for it. It was back to what parrotfish eat. Do they also feed on echinoderms? Ooh, for the most part, we have never seen it, at least here at Marine Lab, munching and crunching on echinoderms. I would have to look more into depth to see if there's ever been a case. Megan, do you know anything about them eating echinoderms? I have not observed any, but if you look on our data sheet, at the end there is a section for other, so if you were to observe it, yeah, just mark it right there. Yeah, and you can always write to the side exactly what that other was, especially if we saw them eating any kind of that would be pretty cool for you to observe that. Once we have the stuff that we can fill out on the boat dive, we'll throw that snorkel gear on, we'll grab our buddy and our instructor, and we'll jump in the water and go to find our parrotfish. When we're looking for a parrotfish, we're going to be looking at the eating behaviors of one single parrotfish. But oftentimes, parrotfish aren't by themselves. So we'll find a group of them, and then you will get to pick exactly which parrotfish you want to observe. Sometimes they're by themselves, but it definitely depends. Once you see it, I always say start your time. When you start that time, you will log in at the top because you're going to need about three minutes of an acclimation period of following that fish around to observe it before you can start monitoring what it's eating. That way we kind of get away from all of the craziness. Maybe it's just eating something because it's afraid of us humans that are swimming above it, or maybe it's just trying to get away. So that acclimation period, that first three minutes, allows for those parrotfish to kind of settle down, get more natural in their behavior. Once you have started that time, you started that acclimation period, you can fill out these next two. You need to identify if it's a stoplight, a blue, a midnight, or a rainbow parrotfish. After that, we can then do our solitary, if it's in a group two to five, five to ten, or over ten. Sometimes it's really cool to see them in big groups over ten. 
And I'd rather that it's often harder to monitor them singularly when it's in that big group because they're all munching and crunching together and you lose track. They're not like humans who have individual fin or different hair colors. They all sometimes blend into one big one. But it is still cool to get that data from that section. Once we have done that and we've gotten through that affirmation period, you and your buddy will restart your timer for another three minutes. In that next three minutes, you are going to be taking your pencil and your clipboard and your eyes and you're going to be tallying everything that parrotfish bites at. So if it's algal turf, you'll tally one right there. If it's macro algae, you'll tally another. And you'll continue to tally until that three minute mark is over or your parrotfish has left the area. Once you are done, you'll put that total observation time from that second recording, so under three minutes or at three minutes max, and then you'll record anything that you might have observed, like macro algae that were bitten. If you knew that it had some alameda, you would write alameda down there. If you saw that it ate some fire coral, you would add that to the bottom as well. Like I said, the more information, the more scientists can make conclusions from these observations or investigate even further. Awesome. We have something from Katie. Hey, Katie. One of her students is working on a project regarding parrotfish grazing and coral disease. Is it possible to get a copy of your data sheet? Ooh, I will comment below after this to make sure we can give you some data. There is that infographic online. I know it's not full data, but we can chat after this to make sure your student gets some good data to add to her project, or we can point her in the direction of someone else who could also give her some good data. All right, so we figured out how we're gonna do it. Do you guys think we can also practice together? Megan? Woo! Megan, do you think you could practice? I can try. Okay, <laughs> if you have it already, there is that virtual site linked above, and there is a sheet just like whoop, this one. <laughs> um, in that virtual site, you scroll down to Parrotfish, it is the activity sheet. And it will have one in here that you can fill out as well. I'll give you guys about 30 seconds. I'll pull up the video right after this. I'm going to go through it with you guys so that we can practice together because practice makes perfect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Katie, if you want that data sheet, if you go over to our virtual page, it'll be there. Ooh, it's dark in here now. Yeah, it is. What's happening? I'm going to give them time for looking at that. I'll start this. You know where we're starting in? Woohoo! Ooh, the Cayman Islands. Do you guys know you're going on a field trip there as well today? It's so exciting. All right, so I'm going to start filling out my data sheet. Oh, I lost my pencil lead while I did it. She hit it too hard. <laughs> I'm so excited about parachute. I threw my pencil. She crushed it against the board. We gotta get closer to you, they can hear you better. My handwriting is getting worse as you watch this. <laughs> the time we're starting, oh, I don't even have my time on, is 222. Oh, it's already 222. Time flies when you're having fun. And let's find our parrotfish. The first screen that we're gonna see is a parrotfish munching and crunching. This is going to be our affirmation period. When it flips over to the next screen, that's when we're going to start recording what it's fighting. So don't feel like you need to rush right now. This guy's helping us with identification a little bit. We got a midnight parrotfish. And he looks like he is all by himself, so we'll circle solitary as well. So you'll see he's eating some of that algal turf, eating some macro algae. He didn't seem to like that piece at all. Spit it back up. But you can see him sometimes taking a little bit of sand with him. What do you guys think happens to that sand that he takes with him? Bonus points for whoever answers that question. All right, we're about to start. All right, starting now. Oh, gosh, what just happened? <laughs> we're going to start. That's okay, gives you more time to get ready. Yes. 
Were you guys paying attention? <laughs> we'll go back to Mr. Parrotfish. Yes, if you guys are following along on that activity sheet, get ready to start ticking how many times he bites things and what he's eating. Some technical difficulties is the uh, epitome of staying at home. Would you agree with that? <laughs> Ooh, oh. Spinning wheel is up. Can you see it? All right. If you have any questions, you can start writing those down. Once we're done with this, I'll answer any and all questions to the best of my ability. Has everyone witnessed a parrotfish before in action? They're pretty fun to see. Anyone would like to share their favorite parrotfish story below? I would love to read them. Oh yeah. It's <laughs> great to see it, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> All right, we might add this video up to our virtual site a little bit later so you guys can practice along. I don't want to hold you guys too much longer because we're taking time out of your day to learn. And it's not supposed to be super long, it's a nice info. So if you have any questions about parrotfish, you can drop those below. As you're dropping them below, I do want to encourage you guys that parrotfish aren't the only animal you can observe their behavior with, just like we are doing right now. There are animals all in your backyard that you can make a chart just like this one, right? Tree, like vegetable garden, leaf, grass, etc. And you could watch one individual eating for a period of time to determine what they might be snacking on, how often they're snacking, maybe if they're snacking at all. It'd be a cool opportunity for you at home. But there's also apps like eBird, that is with Cornell Ornithology, that's good at identifying birds in your backyard. Gives you a little bit of practice, make you a nice master. And there's also iNaturalist, where you could upload pictures of critters in your own backyard, where you've identified, where you've watched their behavior. And that adds to a worldwide database about other animals' behavior. Okay, we have a few questions. Ooh, I love a good question. How many parrotfish do you usually see on the reef? Ooh, that's a good question. It definitely depends on what the location is and what time of day and how many people are screaming at the reef, <laughs> for sure. But usually I would say I see more than 20. Would you agree with that, Megan? Yeah, you usually see a ton. Yeah, out they're there. one of our more abundant fish at our reef. Definitely my favorite. They have a kind of derpy face and they swim with mainly their pectoral fins, the ones on their sides, and they're just like flapping along. It's really fun to watch them. Munching. Alright, we have another one. Can parrotfish use tools? Tools? They use their mouth, which is a pretty cool tool. That yeah. fuse beak. Look at that I beak. You were watching them a little bit earlier, but that fuse beak definitely can munch and crunch. I feel like it would break my finger if I stuck my finger in its mouth, but I've never tried that, and I don't suggest you try it at home. But it <laughs> definitely has a nice, powerful beat, just like a bird would. It's true. All right, can you repeat the app for tracking? Ooh, the app for tracking. So I don't know when it's like specifically like this, but there is eBird, which is used through Cornell, Cornell, <laughs> Cornell Ornithology. <laughs> try to combine those two words. <laughs> Perfect. All right, I don't see any more questions currently. Okay, if you have any more questions, you can always add those to the comments at the end. I'll be monitoring this over the next 24-ish hours. I have nothing better to do than to answer your questions. So feel free to ask them. I would love to answer them. All Make right. sure you guys join us tomorrow with Emma, correct? Emma yes. Beach Watch <laughs> yes. And Coral Disease. It's going to be exciting. Emma is one of our more colorful instructors. We'll make sure you're entertained the entire time. And then Megan also has a little blurb for you about her project from yesterday. Sweet, did I get it to flip? All right, hi guys. Um, I wanted to speak to you quickly again about yesterday with Marine Debris. I went ahead, made a data sheet, uploaded it to our virtual page. It is now under the Citizen Science Week next to Marine Debris. So that way, if you guys are at home collecting data, if you're out there picking up trash, weighing it, measuring it, doing anything with trash, you guys can go ahead and enter that and that data comes to us so that way we can start measuring what you guys are doing, which would be awesome. So if you feel like doing it, go ahead, jump on our virtual page. But otherwise, that is all we have for you guys. Let's see if we can get Nicole in the background. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> we'll see you guys Bye, tomorrow. You guys. <laughs> Have a good day, everyone. Oh, I.